Lord knows you better not break with tradition, right? Controversy at Calvary Chapel in the Thomas. We weren't directed to do everything during our free offering of worship to the Lord. So that was intentional, by the way. Maybe I won't do that again. But you know, you, you are free to worship the Lord and partake. And, you know, certainly when we conclude, you know, there's a good opportunity to take communion. But hey, you know, maybe that's just, I, I told David, maybe I, as like the 10th person, you know, told me, you forgot to tell us what to do. You forgot, what, what, how, how do I drink this? And what do we, what do, we do? Well, Maybe that's a lesson for both of us. Revelation chapter 4, it's good to be here today. Man, wonderful worship, wonderful, wonderful worship. You guys make worship what it is, do you know that? You make worship what it is. When we all come together in that beautiful blend of just sincerity and praise, boy, the Lord just meets us and it is, it is tremendous, isn't it? Revelation 4, verse 1, we continue our course through the New Testament verse by verse. We're in the back of the book here in Revelation, and so we're continuing slowly but surely. The title for our message today, The Reality of the Rapture, The Reality of the Rapture. Let's go to the Lord. Father, we thank you for your word this morning, and we rejoice that you've given us a light unto our feet and a lamp unto our path to direct us, to illuminate our lives to ensure that we walk well, carefully, wisely, that we live fruitfully, that we just be blessed. You want us to be blessed. You've intended for us to be blessed, however you see fit. Lord, but certainly to experience joy and to have peace and hope, Lord, nothing like we see in the world, because all these things come straight from you. You've called us to live a life of purpose, and our subject today Lord, how, how beautifully the rapture gives us priority in life, purpose for our lives, and hopefully, God, uh, a passionate purpose. Speak to us today. Lord, would our hearts just be yielded to your Holy Spirit? Would you love your sheep and feed them this morning? God, intend to us today. Lord, to apply your word, to do what it declares, to be built up in faith. Remember who we are and why we're here, the service that we're privileged to engage in, Lord. Stir all these things up. Send us out, God, we pray, just productively and fruitfully into our week and this Christmas season. God, we're so thankful for you. In Jesus' name, let's say together, amen, amen. Verse 1, Revelation 4. After these things, I looked and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice, the voice of Jesus, which I heard, was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, come up here. Can you say those three words? Come, come Thank you, gentlemen. Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. Flip back to chapter 1, look at verse 19. Here is the divine outline given for the book of Revelation. It divides it up. It helps us understand what it says. Jesus commissioned John, verse 1, pardon me, chapter 1, verse 19. He said, write the things, you can read it with me if you like, which you have seen, and the things which are, and the things, thirdly, which will take place after this or after these things. According to our divine outline, as we look at it here in chapter 1, as we continue our course in chapter 4, here we surely seem to begin the third section of the book of Revelation, this final section, as John now writes of the things. Look at verse 1 of chapter 4, the things which will take place after this. That key expression is used so we can easily identify this third division that we're now entering into. Again, look at verse 1 with me, chapter 4, after these things. The Greek words here are on the screen. It's metatauta, 
And it's a phrase, the same phrase that's used in chapter 1, verse 19, the divine outline. And thus we have a signifying mark to help us splice this book correctly in an appropriate order of events, as it were. After these things, or after this. After what? Well, look down into your Bibles. And what have we seen thus far? We've seen the person of Jesus Christ, chapter 1, right? The things you've seen. Right? The things that are, Jesus said, chapters 2 and 3. The seven letters to the seven churches, right? What we might say uh, exemplifies or symbolizes church history in its entirety. Jesus is talking to the church, chapters 2 and 3. After those two chapters, here we go, 2 plus 3, or pardon me, after 2 and 3 comes 4, and here we are, chapter 4, verse 1, hearing about the things that are yet to come. I'm going to write to you, I'm going to talk to you about the things which will take place after these things, or after all of this. A signifying mark, a very important division of this book, as we've said. If you're still not there, note this with me. In the first three chapters of Revelation, the word church appears 19 times. 19 times. From chapter 4 on, it never appears again. Something is being seen here in chapter 4, verse 1. Amen? Surely a division is taking place, and we firmly believe, according to the divine outline, that this is it. This is the end of church history, as it were. This is our moment This is what we've been living for and preparing for, what we've been believing on from the moment we first heard the gospel. This is it for us, guys. This is our redemption. This is our rescue. This is chapter 4, verse 1, where the church of Jesus Christ is raptured up into heaven. J. Vernon McGee said this. It's on the screen. From here on, you will not find the word church mentioned. The church has gone off the air, he says. It has gone off the air because it went up in the air. It was caught up in the air to meet the Lord in the air. I love this. Are we going to see the church again? Yes. But she's no longer a church. She is a bride, a bride adorned for her husband. Chapter 4, verse 1. Guys, this is significant This is special. This is a monumental moment after the work and ministry of the church and our time is fulfilled. We are taken up to heaven right then and there. And I love how it's worded. Come up here, the Lord says, speaking to John, but prophetically to us. The period and work and ministry of the church, it's achieved, it's accomplished, it's over. Chapter 4, verse 1, our perspective in the book of Revelation, shifts from earth to heaven. And who's in heaven? Who's not seen on the earth? It's you and me. It's the church. Come up here, Jesus says, like a trumpet blast. And as we'll read and discuss this morning, that's the same thing we're going to hear someday real soon. Chapter 4, verse 1, I believe prophetically we see so clearly the rapture of the church. Well, wait a minute, some people will say. I've got friends who have told me that the church is going to endure the great tribulation and we're going to be here and we're a part of this and we've got to pay for that or whatever the case may be. Isn't this one of those areas of Christian controversy? You know, we can't talk about stuff like this because it creates, you know, debate and because people disagree and they get angry and all kinds of other things. Shouldn't we avoid, you know, topics like this where the Bible's not abundantly clear? Yes. If the Bible is not abundantly clear, black, white, and red, on any subject, we've got to be careful. Amen? Amen. In all things, we should agree to disagree, disagree peaceably, but I tell you this, in regard to the rapture, God has made himself crystal clear in his word, in regard to all these things. Yes, prophecy can be a bit complicated at times. And you know what it requires? It requires us to to pull up our big boy pants and put on our thinking caps and study to show ourselves approved. 
Study these things if you want to firm up your faith, and if you don't, you won't. But this is an issue that's not questionable as we search the Scriptures. And we're going to search the Scriptures this morning, folks. Aren't you glad to be done with Laodicea, you know? <laughs> Talk about the rapture today. I mean, this is super great. This is, you know, is, they're both good news, but it's just a little more positive. Acts 17.11. Luke wrote this commentary concerning those Berean believers. He said, now the Berean Jews were of more noble character. This is God's commentary, not yours and not mine. The Berean Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica, for they received the message, the gospel, the message of Paul, with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. I think that's who we should want to be. I think this is how we should conduct ourselves. And if we desire to firm up our faith, be passionate, be productive in this Christian life, then we're going to study the Scripture. Especially as it pertains to our great hope, because I tell you this, there are many prophetic portions of Scripture that we don't have an answer for. They remain kind of a mystery, but this is not one of them. And our viewpoint on the rapture of the church is going to have the greatest effect on how we live our lives. And thus, this is a priority. Thus, this is so important. Can you amen that? Amen. And so this morning, we're going to camp out right here on verse 1. Firstly, if you're taking some notes, it'll all be up on the screen. We're going to address four common misconceptions about the rapture quickly. And then we're going to provide ten reasons. There are a lot more we could give, but time is always the enemy, right? Ten simple reasons for a pre-tribulation rapture. So firstly, our first common misconception about the rapture, take some notes if you would. The word rapture isn't found in the Bible. I looked in my concordance, you say. I flipped to the back, you know, where there sometimes are that concordance. I searched online, man. You know, and, and the word rapture is not in the Bible. I had someone come up to me once and they said the word rapture is not even in the Bible. And I was like, whoa. And they were like, I know. And all these kinds of things. And in reality, they're wrong. Amen? The word rapture, think this through with me, the word rapture comes from a Latin translation, uh, translation of the phrase to be caught up or just caught up. And that expression, remember our Bible is written in Greek, that is the New Testament. It's used 13 times in the New Testament. So believe me, the word is there. In the Greek, it's on the screen, it's the expression harpazo, and that's what it means to be caught up. In the Greek, it means to catch up, to take by force, to catch away, to pluck, to pull. We see it in one of those 13 places, we see it for mostly in this famous rapture text, and we'll talk about this and reference it a lot this morning. 1 Thessalonians 4.16, it's on the screen. Paul says, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, hey, you guys, or whatever, I don't know, that was a bad idea. I'm coming to get you, I don't know. With the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up. And there it is, harpazo. We'll be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord where? On the earth? No, as we'll talk about today. But in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. The rapture is the moment when Jesus calls, as we see right here, and he comes for his church. He doesn't descend to the earth, as we see so clearly in this Bible text, but we are called up and we meet him in the air. And this event is a surprise. It's sudden. It's unanticipated. It's unannounced. And it could happen at any moment, as we'll see shortly. Matthew 24, verse 42, Jesus said this, So you too must keep watch. 
For you don't know what day your Lord is coming. Understand this. If a homeowner knew exactly when a burglar was coming, he would keep watch right on time, right? And not permit his house to be broken into. You also, read this with me, you also must be ready all the time. For the Son of Man will come when least expected. Secondly, another common misconception about the rapture is the identity of the elect. And believe it or not, but this is a big one. A lot of confusion. It's because of this verse, Matthew 24, verse 21. Jesus said, For then there will be great tribulation. That's what we're talking about here. Such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. You ain't seen nothing like this before. The flood, no. Sodom and Gomorrah, no. This day is succinct and set apart, the great tribulation. We're going to talk about that, chapters 6 through 19. Jesus says, and unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Aha, people say. There we see that the elect will be present during the time of the great tribulation. We're going to be here and it's going to be rough, but God will get us through it. And they grasp at straws to maintain that argument. They forget, however, that the Bible calls the elect, well, we see three different distinctions made in regard to whom the Bible calls elect. Firstly, Christians are called the elect. Israel's called the elect in Isaiah chapter 45. And also those who were saved during the Great Tribulation are called the elect of God. So three groups are called the elect. There's confusion there. Which one are we talking about here? Context is always the key, right? That unlocks what a passage says. So read a passage, go back to the beginning, go back to the chapter prior to where you're reading, and sure you know who's speaking, who they're talking to, whether it's prophecy or a present day, you know, applicational truth, all these things are important. We discover exactly who these elect are by reading the verse that's right before verse 21 in Matthew 24, and it's, and it's verse 20. Jesus references the Sabbath. He says, but pray that your flight might not be in winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Why? Because you won't be able to run very fast, will you? Jesus is describing the moment when the Antichrist turns on the people of God, the nation of Israel. He sets himself up as, as God in the temple and says, worship me or die. When that happens, the abomination of desolation is prophesied by the prophet Daniel. You better run, guys, because he's going to kill you. You better pray that your flight doesn't take place on the Sabbath. Why? Have you been to Israel before? Even still today, they are shut down on the Sabbath day, aren't they? Good luck getting out or getting around. Who's Jesus talking to here? As he describes the elect who will be there during the Great Tribulation, and we'll develop this more fully. It's obviously Israel. A Gentile nation such as ours, such as any other, This has no relevance whatsoever, does it? It doesn't apply to us at all. And so we see exactly who the Lord's talking to. Number three, another common misconception about the rapture is the identification of the trumpets. That may sound silly to some of you, but you'll see the verses that cause some confusion. The identification of the trumpets. In 1 Corinthians 15, 51... Paul says this to the church, Behold, I tell you a mystery. And I like this. We love a good mystery, right? We shall not all sleep or die, but we shall all be changed. That's the greatest motto for a nursery there will ever be. Think this through. Paint it up on the walls of our nursery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Come on, parents. You don't get it, do you? Thank you. Give me a little response or I'll just keep going all day long. Okay, pertaining to Christ, maybe you're just super spiritual this morning. We shall not all sleep or die, but we shall all be changed 
in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at what? The last trumpet. Okay, okay. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Thank you. The last trumpet, okay, that's the key, they say. The trumpet will sound, and then the Lord will call us to meet him in the air forever. We'll be in the presence of the Lord. All right. We see seven trumpets in the book of Revelation, don't we? Where's the seventh one? Where's the last trumpet? Chapter 11, Revelation 11. Write it down. Check it out later. But that's not the trumpet that we're talking about, is it? And here's how you know. Some will say, well, the the rapture takes place in the middle of the tribulation because that's where the, you know, last trumpet is seen. And when it's blasted and blown, Revelation 11, right in the middle of the tribulation, well, that's wrong. And here's why. There we read in Revelation 11 that that trumpet is sounded, it's blasted by an angel. However, as we just read, and we'll see again, In 1 Thessalonians 4.16, this trumpet is sounded by God. Look with me again at that key verse for us today. For the Lord himself. This is Jesus. Will descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first, and we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Amen? Amen. One more for you. Another common misconception about the rapture is there on the screen. Confusion about the second coming of Christ. Confusion about the second coming of Christ. Um, These questions come up all the time, don't they? Maybe as you're talking with folks, there's a misunderstanding of the two comings of Christ, as it were. In reality, there's just one. That's his second coming. It's not to be associated with the rapture of the church. Write this down, Revelation 19. We'll get there eventually. But that's where we see the second coming of Jesus Christ to planet Earth. He came first as a suffering servant. He died. But he's coming again to this Earth. And let me tell you what, read Revelation 19. He's coming in a whole different way this time isn't he? As a conquering king on a white horse with many crowns, he's coming to make war, to rule and reign on planet earth, but not just to rule and reign with you and me. We see ourselves there in Revelation 19, but he's coming to rescue Israel. It's not just, you know, a a return to the earth, but it's a rescue mission, as it were. It's not a rapture. Nobody's going up at all. But in fact, we're all coming back down with the Lord as he returns to the earth. And the fact is, the second coming of Christ is a predictable event, isn't it? For reasons that I didn't want to touch on this morning that get a little complicated, but it's completely predictable. You time when the Antichrist comes on the scene, makes a seven-year peace treaty with the people of Israel and the Middle East. Halfway through, that's two and a half. He breaks it, sets sets himself up as God and demands to be worshipped. Time two and a half more years from then, da-da-da-da-da-da, there's the second coming of Jesus Christ. This event is fairly easy to predict. It's not the rapture of the church because of that day and hour, no one knows. Jesus made so perfectly clear to us. But this second coming of Christ, the whole world will see it. The whole world will know. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 27, for as the lightning comes out of the east and shines even to the west, so also shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Are we talking about the rapture here? No. We're talking about the second coming of Christ to planet Earth. No one knows the day or the hour when the church will be redeemed, we will meet him in the air and forever be in his presence. No one knows. People still keep trying to predict. I hope you don't buy those books. I hope you don't watch those videos. I hope when you see that controversy come up, somebody's finally got it. The Bible code's been cracked. I've got divine revelation. 
No, you don't. Because you're calling God a liar. So I, I really don't think that's going to work out well. Give money to the church. Give money for the gospel. Don't buy garbage like that. Can I say that? Am I allowed to say that? No one knows, Jesus said, the day or the hour. And we'll talk about that a little further. As we now transition and write this down, te uh, ten reasons for a pre-tribulation rapture. Ten reasons for a pre-tribulation rapture. And we'll see if we make it. I think we will. At least we'll try. Ten reasons for a pre-tribulation rapture. That is a Revelation 4-1 rapture. The period of the church's ministry is over. And Jesus says, a, do a door is open in heaven. And the Lord says, come up here. And whoo, we meet him in the air and we enter into heaven where we're seen in Revelation 4 and 5. Can't be anyone else but us. Number one. Ten reasons for a pre-tribulation rapture. This doctrine is intended to bring comfort to Christians. You can give some shorthand to that. I know it's long. It's meant to be a comforting doctrine. We read it already. Paul said it in 1 Thessalonians 4.16 in regard to the rapture. The Lord himself will descend, voice of an archangel, trumpet of God, will be caught up together, meeting the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Read verse 18 with me. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. This is comforting to those who are suffering, to those who are sick, and so many other states, isn't it? The Lord is coming. He's on his way. And thus I take peace. I have solace. I have rest in that reality, the reality of the rapture. This is true. This is real. This is right. The Lord's coming. I need to hold on to that by faith. Continue to be productive, not turn inward, but keep my life open and outward. Amen? Can you imagine what kind of outlook? I can't because I don't have that outlook, to be honest with you. Those who believe in a mid-trib rapture or a post-tribulation rapture, what hope, what comfort is there at all in this? <laughs> it's going to be rough, man. You know, creatures are coming down and the world is decimated and, 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 and heaven, as it were, is ripped open. I mean, all these crazy things are going on. Hang in there, buddy. You know? What is that? How is that relevant to, how does it apply toward a believer in Jesus Christ? It just doesn't make sense at all. And we'll continue to see that so clearly, I pray. This is a reality that's meant to bring comfort, and the rapture does. Before judgment. Not in the middle of God's wrath. Not after his wrath has been poured out but before it ever comes. And that's our second point as well. Secondly, Christians are not appointed to suffer God's wrath. Aren't you glad there's a Bible verse that tells you this so you can know it and bank on it? 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, I'm so glad it's there. For God did not appoint us to wrath. That's super cool. Amen? But to obtain what? Salvation. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, as we celebrated today, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with Him. Whether we're alive or dead, we're going to be with Him, live together with Him. Once again we read, therefore, comfort each other and edify one another just as you also are doing. We're going to see this over and over again as we get into the Great Tribulation, chapters 6 through 19. The wrath of God, make no mistake, is being poured out. And it's not just the wrath of God the Father, it's the wrath of the Lamb. Who's going to save us, the world says, from the wrath of the Lamb? This is crazy. This is radical, what's going on right now. That's not for us. Aren't you glad that the Bible simply says this to be so? Listen, any wrath you deserve. What did we celebrate today, guys? You deserve the wrath of God for your sin. And yet all of our rightful, you know, wrath was poured out unto Jesus Christ. What does Paul say in 2 Corinthians 5, 21? For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. 
You deserve the wrath of God and me so much more. But all of that wrath, all of that judgment was poured out on him so you could walk away scot-free. Thank you, Lord, is amen and absolutely right. Thank you. We're not appointed to wrath. Thirdly, a pre-tribulation rapture is illustrated all over the Bible. We'll pull a few. Firstly, in Genesis 19. It's illustrated in Genesis 19. There in Genesis 19, we see angels rescuing Lot and his family before the destruction of the cities of the plain, Sodom and Gomorrah. What's interesting is verse 22, the angel says to Lot, hurry, get up, get moving, escape, for I cannot do anything until you arrive at your safe destination. You're, you're clear of God's judgment that's coming down. I can't involve you. I can't endanger you. I can't touch it until you're, you know, gone from it, as it were. Now, we look at the life of Lot and we'd say, seriously, you know, this, this is an example or an illustration of the rapture? I mean, come on, get real. This guy was crazy. This guy wasn't an example that we should follow. And yet, Peter calls him righteous. Peter says this in reference to this story. In 2 Peter 2, verse 9, Peter's using this as an illustration of our point, not me. He says this, talking about Lot and his deliverance. If God, as it were, delivered Lot before judgment fell, then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations. That word is tribulation. And to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. Can't God do this? Isn't God going to do that? Yes, Peter says, he is. Righteous Lot. Number four, a pre-tribulation rapture is illustrated also with Enoch. Enoch, you remember that guy? Enoch was taken to heaven before the flood came. Some know this and some don't. Genesis 5.23 says this, Enoch lived 365 years, and I love the picture here, right, of fellowship. Walking in close fellowship with God, then one day, come on, is the Lord like kidding here? Then one day he disappeared because God took him. <laughs> come on, Lord, I mean, really? I mean, that's awesome. The judgment of the flood is coming, and God gives us a character to look to and say, huh, yeah, you know, the Lord could do this. In fact, the Lord is going to do that. Why did God take Enoch? Because God didn't want Enoch to die in the flood. Why didn't God put Enoch in the ark? Because he's talking to you and because he's telling me that the rapture is a reality. Amen? Amen. You've got it wrong, some will say. Noah is the example or illustration for us. You see, they were sealed in the ark and they were protected through the great tribulation and they came out on the other side, you know. And with that, I would absolutely not agree, but I would say that the ark and Noah and his family are certainly a type of picture of Israel, aren't they? Because Israel will go through the great tribulation. They will be protected of God. God's going to be working with his people. And as we'll see shortly, they're going to come to Christ. And as Paul says, all of Israel will be saved in that day and in that time. It's going to be powerful. And so you can be Noah, but I'd rather be Enoch. It's up to you. This Bible joke for you. Number five, a pre-tribulation rapture is also illustrated in Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3. Here we see the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and to bed we go. That's a Bible joke for my kids. Abednego. And there it's the account of the fiery furnace. Nebuchadnezzar builds, you know the story. If not, go read it. Attend a Sunday school class. These guys are great. Big gold statue. Worship it or die. I'll throw you in the fiery furnace if you don't. Daniel's three friends, we read. Daniel... 
and his three friends, that's how they're called in the scripture, you know, refused to bow, or at least these three did, chucked in the fiery furnace. It's a long story, but you can go read it later. But who was missing during this encounter? Persecuted for not worshiping an idol and chucked into the fiery furnace where the Lord was with them. Are we catching a theme and maybe a picture here? Those were the three friends of Daniel. Hot times, man. Hard times of affliction and persecution. Tribulation, as it were. Those three were chucked into the fiery furnace. But who was not here, who was not present, who was omitted from this story, but their leader, as it were, you know? Daniel. Where was Daniel during this whole ordeal? Did Daniel bow down and it's all good, boys. You go ahead and take a stand. I'm going to bow down to the image. I'm not going to get thrown into the fiery furnace. No, that's not who he was. That's not who he is. That's not his character at all. Who's absent conveniently from this story? Is this a picture? Is this another lesson we see from the scripture? I certainly think it is. And Bible commentaries have their reasons as to why Daniel's missing. And for mostly uh, conservative ones, we see them as a, a picture and illustration of the rapture. And it's powerful, isn't it? Number six, a pre-tribulation rapture is endorsed by Jesus Christ. I think that should be like our only reason. Amen? Like the only one we'd ever need. But here's nine more, you know. It's a center of controversy, and I don't know why when Jesus himself taught this very thing and we've covered this previously, Jesus told us to pray and live a prepared life, didn't he? And I hope you're doing that. I hope you're watching and praying and that you're living a prepared life. Prepared for what? Prepared for our redemption, our rapture. Jesus said, Luke 21, verse 36, watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass in regard to the tribulation and to stand before the Son of Man. Jesus had some pretty serious words to a few of the churches. You remember those seven letters we talked about? To Thyatira specifically, he made reference to the fact you better repent or it's tribulation for you. You're going to go into, you're going to enter that time period prophetically, we believe that to be the case. And so the warning is relevant. Get real, get right, watch and pray. Live as though the Lord were coming today, tonight, in order that you can be counted worthy or prepared to go when the rest of us do in that glorious rapture, when we're caught up, amen? Number seven, a pre-tribulation rapture makes sense historically and biblically. In accordance with Jewish custom and culture in history, when a Jewish man would want to marry a particular young lady, he would first go to his father and he'd add on to his father's house. He'd prepare a place, a room, for he and his future bride. And when that place was prepared, good lessons there for young men today, by the way, you with that? Pause for a moment. So he'd go get his father's permission and he'd begin to build and prepare a place. He'd add on to his father's house and make a room for he and his proposed you know, bride to live in. And when the addition, the room was complete, he'd go to his father, dad would inspect it. And if it were done well and right, dad would say, okay, it's time. And the trumpet would be sounded. And any time, day or night, according to the Jewish culture and history, and there's a picture here. Anytime, day or night, the trumpet would be blasted, the bridegroom would go get his bride, and there they would be married. The ceremony, you know, would be sweet, but right then and there starts the honeymoon, and that's kind of unique and interesting to this end. For seven days, he'd take his bride into this place that he had prepared. For seven days, they wouldn't work. 
They wouldn't do anything else except just enjoy each other. And the, the culture and custom, you know, the families would bring food and kind of set it outside the door and, you know, make sure they're all kind of taken care of and whatnot. It's kind of just a beautiful thing, but there they would be tucked away privately for seven days. And after those seven days, the bridegroom would, would come out and produce his bride and show her off to the world and introduce her to much of the community. Does that not tie together a number of scriptures that are already coming into your mind? Things that Jesus said. It's in many ways going to be the very same thing with us. Jesus has gone to prepare a place for us. John 14, verse 1, Jesus said to his disciples around that last supper table, he said, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. There is more than enough room in my father's home. If this were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. That's powerful to me. That's radical, right? It's a time, as Jesus said in Matthew 24, 36, it's only known by the Father, and that fits with this picture, this tradition, this cultural kind of observation. The trumpet will sound, the Lord will come get us, and he takes us away for seven years or so on that glorious honeymoon, and there we will be with him in heaven. And after that period, hell on earth, but it's honeymoon in heaven, guys. Seven years with him there, and then we come down back to the earth with him to be presented to the world as his bride, to rule and reign for that thousand years. And we'll get there later. Number eight, <clears throat> a pre-tribulation rapture follows the divine outline that we've talked about so much here in Revelation. Chapter 1, verse 19, as we covered previously, right? It's so interesting to me that one of the, the toughest books to figure out, actually, I don't think that it is, Daniel's worse, Ezekiel's, man, difficult, man, right? Much of that's sealed. You're not supposed to understand it. But Revelation, you are intended by God to understand. It's the only book of the Bible that comes with directions. Chapter 1, verse 19, God says, here's how you read this book. Here's how you split it up. I'm going to make it really simple for you so that you can understand and be ready not sit around and debate and share your various viewpoints, but get up and get out the doors and go preach the gospel and prepare the world to be raptured, right? To be saved before judgment. If you have a different view in regard to the rapture than what we simply see scripturally, man, it, 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 it twists up the book of Revelation like a pretzel, man. It's just, it makes no sense. And so too you'll find with those who have a different, you know, a mid-tribulational rapture or a post-tribulational rapture. They say the rapture isn't real at all, and it's just crazy Christians, you know, wishing to be spared from judgment, as if that's a bad thing. It's kind of what we celebrate in Christ, right? <clears throat> None of it makes any sense. If you believe in a mid-tribulation rapture, then you have to take chapters 4 and 5, you have to rip them out, and you have to put them after chapter 11, as we've already said. Okay, if the rapture's in chapter 11 in the middle of the trip, so I have to rip this out, and I'm going to put this over here, and that's how that works. If you believe in a post-tribulational rapture, then you have to rip out chapters 4 and 5, because that's where we see ourselves in heaven before the tribulation ever begins. The work of the church is done. There we are in heaven, and then the tribulation begins. But you have to rip out chapters 4 and 5 and place them after chapter 19. And yay, then we're raptured. It just doesn't work. It doesn't follow the divine outline that we simply see in chapter 1, verse 19. Moving quickly, number 9, the tribulation is unnecessary for the church. It just doesn't make sense at all does it? The wrath of the Lamb is being poured out on a Christ-rejecting world. Have you rejected Jesus? I hope not. Some of you need to get saved, and I hope you do today. Amen? Amen. I hope you haven't rejected Jesus Christ. If so, the tribulation is for you. But for those who have embraced Jesus Christ, it's not for you. So it makes no sense that we would be here at all. 
To add some weight to that argument, Jeremiah 30, verse 7, do you know what it calls the Great Tribulation? It calls it the time of Jacob's trouble. Who's Jacob? Israel. It's not you. It's not me, and it's not the church. But certainly God is going to be pouring out his spirit on his people Israel, and through this Great Tribulation, they're going to wake up, and they're going to see Jesus Christ and embrace him as their Messiah. A couple of verses for you. It seems we're short on time. I'll just read this. Romans 11, verse 25, Paul talks about this very thing, that the tribulation is not for us, but God's going to use it to work in his people Israel, and thus they'll be saved. Romans 11, verse 25, Paul says, I want you to understand this mystery, dear brothers and sisters, so that you will not feel proud about yourselves. Some of the people of Israel have hard hearts, but this will last only until the full number of Gentiles comes to Christ. Time of the church, the Gentile church is coming to an end. It's going to be over, and guess what? God's going to pour out his spirit. He's going to work in a way that Israel will understand. And so, Paul says, verse 26, all Israel will be saved. As the scriptures say, the one who rescues will come from Jerusalem, and he will turn Israel away from ungodliness. And this is my covenant with them, that I will take away their sins. Paul now says, many of the people of Israel are now enemies of the good news, and this benefits you Gentiles. Yet they are still the people he loves because he chose their ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, for the gifts and his call, or God's gifts and his call, can never be withdrawn. It's glorious. It's a time for them and not for you. Amen? Amen. Lastly, one more and we'll wrap this up. A pre-tribulation rapture ensures that we seek first the kingdom. Simply put, whether you agree or disagree, I don't know how you could disagree, but that's cool. You know, I pray we can do so agreeably. We're not going to present or preach really any other viewpoint in this church because I don't think the scripture declares anything else. But anyone is free to hold that viewpoint. But I pray we see the practical importance of this last point, no matter what that viewpoint might be. This is, without question, the simplest, the the healthiest, the wisest way that we Christians could ever live, believing that Jesus were coming right now, today, tonight, because that's what he said. And thus living our lives, being ready for that moment. Jesus said, Matthew 24, 44, you also must be ready all the time. For the Son of Man will come when least expected. He illustrates A faithful, sensible servant is one to whom the master can give the responsibility of managing his other household servants and feeding them. If the master returns and find that the servant has done a good job, there will be a reward. I tell you, the master will put that servant in charge of all he owns. And there's the point and the application for us. And it's in regard to productivity being faithful in the work, in the ministry, using the talents that the Lord has given us for his glory, being about his business, there is reward there for what you do here. And that's what our eyes should be set on. Authority and purpose and privilege and reward for those who wait and watch and are ready. But for those who don't have this viewpoint, um, those who think that the The Antichrist is the first one that they'll see. None of this just really makes sense, does it? Those who have a mid-tribulational viewpoint, post-tribulation rapture, they're watching for one person, not Jesus Christ. They're looking for the Antichrist, as Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 4, because he's going to come first. And then, of course, the peace treaty with Israel, broken halfway through, abomination of desolation, seven years of tribulation, and then the Lord comes back. So, it's just a bit backward, isn't it? Does that sound like God's will for you? Does that make sense? Okay, guys, he's coming soon. 
the Antichrist is on his way. Watch and be ready. Keep your eyes peeled to Fox News or CNN. Let's try to figure out who this guy is, you know. What a waste of time and energy and effort. And we do these things. Obama's the Antichrist. That is, I'm out of time. I, 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 I can't comment. Someone said this, read it, it's on the screen. Two factors kept the early church on fire. The empowering of the Holy Ghost and the belief that Jesus would return during their lifetime. But he didn't come back in their day, you say. And you're right. But do you think those early believers are in heaven now saying, we didn't get bogged down in materialism or trivial pursuits. We sought the Lord. We witnessed fervently. We lived for the kingdom. If only we knew he wasn't coming, we could have played more racquetball. No, this author says. They're ecstatic that they chose to do what Jesus says to do in every generation, to watch, to be ready, to live for his coming. Lastly, John says, 1 John 3, 2, Dear friends, we are already God's children, but he has not yet shown us what we will be like when Christ appears. But we do know that we will be like him, for we will see him as he really is. Listen. And all who have this eager expectation will keep themselves pure, just as Jesus is pure. There is no other way biblically for we Christians to live. The ones who see it, and believe it, receive it, live according to it, are going to keep themselves hot and vibrant for the Lord, fruitful, pure in God, and prepared for his coming. I pray that's what we do. Lord, we look at the world today and we see its darkness and dysfunction and we have to say, not only come quickly, Lord Jesus, but how can you wait any longer? And though we're filled with emotion, God, we choose to keep ourselves um, fixed on this end, being prepared and ensuring that those in our lives that you love are also prepared for your coming. You have provided yourself a sacrifice for our sins so that we would not be judged. Lord, having your wrath poured out on us and spending an eternity separated from you, God, make us about one thing. Building up your church and preaching the gospel of glory, the gospel of life, the gospel of hope, the gospel of peace. Sharpen us, Lord. And equip us, we pray through this study today, to ensure that we are living in light of your soon coming. Bless your people. Excite us, Lord. Focus us. Use us, we pray. In Jesus' name, let's say together. Amen. And amen. Some lovely folks up here to pray for you.